Well, speaking of covenant children, it's uh, a great joy when one of them goes away to college and is sending me Thanksgiving weekend song requests in September. And so I need to fulfill one of those requests now, not that we wouldn't be singing the song otherwise, but uh, one young man who shall remain nameless was eager to sing number 100 in the Red Trinity Hymnal and a wonderful song to remember today. Holy, 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 indeed we serve and worship a holy and a mighty God. Let's stand together sing all four verses. Luke chapter 20 is our sermon text for this morning. We have seen the word of God and the promises of God this morning, as we have observed and taken part in baptism, and now we hear the word of God, the very words of God given to us by the power of the Spirit. Before we read this text, let us bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, would you now come and By your Spirit, speak through these words. Would you cleanse your servant of of all sin, of anything that would hinder your truth being proclaimed today? We need your help, your word, your truth in order to live. May we live and breathe off of what we receive here 
for your name's sake and for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Luke 20, verse 27 through 40. God's holy word, let us attend to its reading. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared him, dared to ask him any more questions. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God endures forever. Amen. Life goes on. Life goes on. We've all heard this phrase. Most of the time when people use this phrase, what they're communicating is that uh, life tends to follow certain patterns, and these certain patterns seem to never change. A day follows a day, a week, a month, the years and decades go by, and these cycles go on and on. Many times people use this phrase when speaking of the death of a friend or of a loved one. Life goes on. But it raises the question, doesn't it, will it always be this way? Will it always be this way? Will life continue one day, week, month, year after the next? Well, for the Christian, no. No, of course, we don't believe that. And if we believed that, we indeed would have no hope. What would be the purpose and the meaning to all things in history and in the world if God were not doing something greater and bringing all things to a consummate end. God is working in history towards that end where the dead will be raised and where those who are the children of God will be with him forever. I read this week, history is the arena in which God unfolds his plan and his people are those in whom God is accomplishing his purposes. Why it's so important that we celebrated what we did today to be reminded of the fact that we are in the covenant God's people. The ultimate coherence of the story of history must go beyond the grave itself to what God is working out in the resurrection of the dead. So here's our life-transforming reality today. God's word, our world, and the deepest realities of our hearts testify that this life is, all, is not all that there is. But we are only worthy of partaking in the eternal life of the resurrection by trusting in the only one who himself was worthy, Jesus Christ. There are many things that testify that this life is not all that there is. But we are only worthy in partaking of eternal life by trusting in the one who was himself worthy, Jesus Christ. So we'll talk and think about these two ages today, the two ages that we see in this passage before us, this age and that age. So our three three main points are this. First is the overlap of the ages, the overlap of the ages. Secondly, the evidence for the ages. And that lastly, deliverance from one age to the other. First, the overlap of the ages. In last week's passage, And we saw Jesus deal with this question that was put to him by the Pharisees. Very famous question, very famous interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus' answer was so insightful 
And it, it was uh, so, it shocked them so much that the Pharisees decide they're going to be, be silent from now on. Whatever strategy they employ to try to overthrow Jesus and to stop his movement, it's not going to be by asking him questions. So we see uh, in verse 26 there, they become silent. That makes way for the Sadducees. It's a smaller group, but certainly well known in Israel. They had many things that were, they were different from the Pharisees. They were fiercely loyal to the written law. They had no regard for oral tradition. And of course, uh, important for our consideration today, they denied the physical resurrection of the body at the end of all things. This is why they ask Jesus about the resurrection itself. They're trying to show that such an idea is absurd. If you follow out the logic of the resurrection, it will create all kinds of situations that make no sense. And surely God would not have his world uh, go on in such a way. So they construct this situation around this law that was called leveret marriage. The law is listed in uh, or given for us in Deuteronomy 25. It says this, if brothers live together and one of them dies without having a son, the dead man's wife must not remarry someone outside the family. Instead, her late husband's brother must go to her and marry her. In the context of Jewish, Jewish culture, this was a way to honor the deceased brother. Hard for us to relate, right? Most of us, if we unexpectedly le left this world, we wouldn't expect, nor perhaps would we want, our spouses to go and find the closest sibling to us for their next mate. But this was something that uh, they used in order to uphold their honor and shame culture. This was to honor uh, the deceased brother. And so from this next marriage, when the brother-in-law of this woman would come and they would be married, that first child of that new marriage would be considered the son of the man who had deceased. It's for uh, this reason that the Sadducees are saying, if you really draw this out, you could have a sort of reductio ad absurdum. It would produce an absurd result. But it shows us the kind of way that the Sadducees are thinking about the resurrection, isn't it? That they're thinking about it, really, what it would be is just sort of a continuation of this life, a continuation of the patterns of this life. What Jesus shows them, what Jesus shows us today through his words, is that the character of the age of the resurrection is so unlike our age today that all of these situations will not be of a problem at all. Jesus says people will not marry, nor will they be given in marriage. There will be fundamental differences that make this kind of situation not a problem at all. As we turn to this passage, we see that Jesus uses two phrases, this age and that age. We've got to get a sense for what he means by that. And the Bible gives us all kinds of information about this age and what it usually calls the age to come. There are many people that say if you take the whole sweep of Scripture, there are many different ages. Some people say there's like seven different ages of God doing different things at different times. Really, ultimately, there is two. There is this age and there is the age to come. By this age, Jesus means all of human history after the fall up until that point. At its most basic level, it is life lived under the weight and the curse of sin, under sin and death, and the patterns that sin and death bring about. People marry, and they are given in marriage. Generations are raised, and then eventually pass away. Life comes into full bloom, and then slowly descends. Life goes on, as many people say. This is what seems normal to us in terms of our experience. But if we really consider what it is. I think particularly if you, are, uh, if you have to come close to some kind of intense suffering where you see death creep upon someone, you will think to yourself, this is not the way that it is supposed to be. You think about why we were created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That last word is pretty important, pretty significant, isn't it? If something about our creation by God points us to eternity, then death is ultimately not the way that it is supposed to be. The Bible speaks 
negatively of this age. And when it, when it speaks negatively of this age, we need to understand that it, it doesn't mean that everything in this created world is bad and we need to flee from it. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks, right, where Jesus interacts with the Pharisees. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. There are many things in this created world that are good and that we are to participate in. But what they bring about are not ultimate things. They are penultimate things. Ultimately, we, we are concerned, ultimately, with what God is doing relative to eternity. So we are to participate in many things in this world, to join hands with non-believers, to work together for the betterment of this world. But we also need to keep that in its proper place. And then when the world talks about, or when the Bible talks about this present age, it's often talking about the course of the system of this world under sin and death. And so we read in 1 Corinthians 3 that God has made foolish the wisdom of this age. God commands us to not be conformed to this age in Romans 12. He calls the devil the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4. Perhaps most pointedly, Paul speaks to the Ephesian Christians. He says, when you were dead in your transgressions and sins, before you were converted by the gospel, you followed the course of this age. So this age is marked by this bondage to sin and death and the curves. What is the age to come? Well, look at our passage in front of us. Jesus gives us several uh, explicit points about what that age or the age to come is. It is an eternal age. It is one of eternal life. Those who partake in that age will no longer die, he says. They shall be like the angels. Now that's that's a phrase that people say, whoa, what does that mean? And there's been a lot of wondering, what what does Jesus mean by saying they're not like the angels, particularly as it says that they no longer marry or are given in marriage. We have our mental picture of angels, sort of the light, floaty, heavenly beings wearing white robes. You read about angels in the scriptures, much more fearsome, right? A different kind of creature altogether. Six wings, for instance, the the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, these fearsome and powerful creatures. Jesus isn't saying that uh, we become angels. He's saying we will be like the angels. And what he means by that in this passage is simply that we will no longer be subject to decay. We will no longer be subject to Death and those patterns of life that we know in this age will be no more. We take all kinds of evidence from elsewhere in Scripture. We will have human bodies in the new heavens and the new earth, but they will be human bodies that are fit for eternal life. So, in short, then the age to come is the age of eternal life. But that highlights one more thing that we need to know, and that is the time in which we are now living. In between Christ's first coming and his second coming, the Bible tells us that we live in this overlap of the ages. Both this age and the age to come are present in the world now. At the time of Jesus' life, the picture in most people's minds was pretty simple. We are living in this age, then the Messiah comes, and the Messiah ushers in the age to come. It's a very linear model. And that watershed moment was the Messiah comes. This age ends and the age to come begins. And the idea was that God would usher in the age to come by using his Messiah king so that he would know and he would be so that all the world would know that God is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So if you're familiar with the language of the New Testament, maybe you see where I'm going with this because the New Testament makes clear that Jesus Christ is reigning and ruling above all things. Philippians 2, he has been given a name that is above every name. And in that sense, God is using his Messiah King to make his name known throughout the nations, throughout the world. Jesus reigns and he rules and he shall reign where'er the sun runs along its journeys. Something about the reign of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the ascension of Christ, and particularly his sitting at the right hand of God right now, is so important for us to know that uh, the, the New Testament apostles say that his reign shares in the blessings and the realities of the age to come. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1. It says that God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated in him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, here it is, not only in this age, but also in the one 
to come. So by the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ, the age to come has already begun. It has already begun. But this age is not over. We still feel the effects of sin and death and all, all those patterns uh, that we know somewhat as normal. So it's not that linear picture. There is this overlap of the ages. Secondly, then, the evidence for the ages. Why? Why should you care? Why should this kind of thing matter to you? Well, let's look at the end of the passage where Jesus says, all are alive to him. And fundamentally, foundationally, what we mean to say today is that these questions, these issues, these realities are things from which you cannot run from, from which you cannot run forever. You cannot run from these realities forever. Why? Because all live to the Lord. Death and departure from this earth does not mean that you cease to be. And this goes back to fundamentally who we are as human beings. We live in a world where most people think everything is material. Uh, well, what we see is, is what you can observe, and that is what is real. The Bible confronts us with a different reality. We are bodies, and we are souls. At the end of the passage, Jesus has this very interesting insight. He says, think about this. When the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, three men who had died many, many years earlier. Jesus says, if uh, human beings, when they died, ceased to exist, would an all-knowing, omnipotent, and sovereign God say that he is the God of three men who have ceased to exist, who have no present existence? Jesus says, no, of course not. Confronted with this truth everywhere in Scripture. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, we read that it is God who gives to every man his spirit, Zechariah 12.1 says that God forms the spirit of man within him. Hebrews 12.9 says that God is called the father of spirits. Not only in scripture, but also outside in the world, there is abundant evidence for the immaterial existence of human beings, of our souls, all kinds of evidence. Think about how often, even in our divided age, think about how often our public conversations revolve around concepts like good and evil, or justice, or love. None of those things make any sense in a materialistic universe. If human beings are nothing but fizzing stardust, if they're nothing but the products of time plus matter plus chance, things like evil and good and justice and love don't make sense. You cannot appeal to justice unless you have a sense of a sor the source for justice. You cannot appeal to good and evil unless you have some objective point of reference for good and evil that goes beyond human beings. You cannot make sense out of love without the idea of life's intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value of life comes from being products of our creator. Can man live without God? Well, in terms of his experience, in terms of what he constructs in his own mind, perhaps he can live without God. But logically, you cannot make sense of this life without God, and ultimately, you cannot live without God, because both judgment and resurrection are coming. We read in Scripture that in the days of Noah, they were marrying and they were being given in marriage. People were saying life goes on, one day continues after the next. Things never seem to change. And then what happened? Judgment came. And so Jesus is showing us just how essential these things are. But the question is, how do we become partakers in that age, the age of the resurrection? And that brings us to our final point this morning, being delivered from one age to the other verse 35, there's this really interesting word that puts us on the track to understand how it is that we become partakers in the age to come. And that word is worthy. Jesus says those who are considered worthy to take part in the age to come are the ones who will have this experience. Jesus teaches a lot about this kind of thing. For instance, Matthew 13, really important passage to get a sense for uh, the, the, the difference between this age and the age to come or when that happens. Jesus says the kingdom of God grows, it advances, 
And then at the end of the age, the Son of Man comes again. He says, the righteous will be separated from the evil. The righteous ones will be separated from the evil ones. The righteous ones will enjoy fellowship with God. Evil will be tossed into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it comes down to this. The righteous and the evil will be separated at the day of judgment. So, righteousness. How are all of us doing with that standard? How are all of us doing if we think about whether or not we are righteous? We think about whether or not God would find us as righteous. It was Malcolm Muggeridge who said, uh, nothing is as historically verifiable as the depravity of the human heart, and yet nothing is at the same time more intellectually resisted. You can look at all of the evidence of human history, and one thing that you will conclude is that the heart of man is sinful. And in our age, nothing seems to knock us off this grand opinion we have of ourselves. A famous apologist and author, Ravi Zacharias, put it this way. He said, Jesus came to earth, and by his life and by his words, he diagnosed the malady and the evil of your heart like no one else who has, like no one else who has ever lived or will ever live. Jesus Christ diagnoses the evil in your heart and in mine. And sure, perhaps maybe the evil that that we have perpetuated on this earth is nothing compared to the Stalins or the Hitlers or the Maos. But ask yourself this. In the quiet of your own heart, in the quiet of your own mind, would you be comfortable with airing all of the thoughts, all of the desires that you have had to your closest loved ones or before God himself. You think about this. Have you ever done anything that needs to be forgiven? Don't think back too far because the thoughts will start to become really discouraging. Have you ever done anything that needs to be forgiven? And here is where the answers of Christianity, here is where the answers of the Christian gospel are completely unlike the answers that you will find anywhere else. Because when you realize that you need a Savior, when you realize that you desperately need a Savior and need to be saved from your sins, it is only Jesus who gives you an absolute and surefire solution to the malady and the evil of your heart. It was Blaise Pascal who said, It is in vain, O man, that you search within yourselves for the cure of your miseries. For there you will only find the confirmation that you cannot produce in yourself that which is true or that which is good. This brings us back to the overlap of the ages and those who are considered worthy of the age to come. What are the answers that you find elsewhere in the world? Islam will say, at the day of judgment, what happens is you stand before God and it comes down to whether or not your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Will your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds? Think about a worldview like Buddhism or even Hinduism, which have many differences between themselves, but it really comes down to this. Your life is about paying off your karmic cycle. New Age spirituality, which is about sort of realizing the divine in you, but there's this process you must go through, and there's really no explicit instruction about whether or not you know that has actually happened. You receive your loan, your bank loan statement at the beginning of every month, and maybe you don't like receiving that loan statement, but at least you know exactly how much you owe and how long it is before you pay it off. The problem with any other any other faith system other than Christianity is that you do not know where you stand. You don't know how long you'll have to pay off all of your sin. You don't know where you stand before God. You don't know what the answer is going to be on the day of judgment. But the Bible gives us the best news that we will ever hear. Life, eternal life, life in the age to come, can be yours now through faith in Jesus Christ, through trusting in what he has done in order to cure us from the evil in our hearts. When someone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the gospel, through the life that comes through that proclamation, the blessings of eternal life, Life in the age to come comes intruding upon this present time now and comes to those who believe in Christ through faith, who still dwell in this present age, but the life of the age to come comes to them as they embrace the Lord and their Savior. Galatians 1, 3-4 says this, 
Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins in order to deliver us from this present evil age. The book of Colossians says this, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. One last question that we have though. Jesus says these blessings are given to those who are considered worthy. Worthy. How does the Christian gospel answer that? How do those who believe in Jesus Christ be considered worthy of the age to come? When we, when we trust in Christ, when we believe the good news, all that Jesus did is credited to our account. What did Jesus do? He lived perfectly just, never sinned once. As the perfect one, he went to the cross. So the one who trusts in Jesus can know for certain and understand that the death that he died on the cross, he died for sinners. So when accusations are thrown your way, you could imagine on the day of judgment, if an accusation were thrown your way, you have not paid the price for sin. You can say, trusting in your Savior and clothed in the robes of his righteousness, you can say, I have paid the price for sin. I have died the death that sin demanded that I die. For my Lord and my Savior suffered the pains of hell for me on the cross. Not only was his death a substitutionary work, but his life was a representative work. The obedience that he was perfect in achieving in his life, that is credited to those who believe in the gospel. And that's why Jesus can say that... uh, that all of those who are considered worthy are sons of God. Galatians chapter 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that's not chauvinistic type of language, right? Paul doesn't refrain from saying sons and daughters of God through faith because he's some kind of chauvinist. What he is saying is that male and female, slave and free, Greek and Jew, all are considered heirs of the kingdom of God Sons of God through Jesus Christ because of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Revolutionary type of thinking because of the gospel. No matter who you are in this life, what your walk in life is, you can be a son of God through Jesus Christ. And then the connection to that, Jesus says, this is the glory of the assurance. He says, the sons of God are the sons of the resurrection. One group is the same as the other group. The sons of God are the sons of the resurrection. This blessedness, this assurance comes through the glorious promises of the gospel. This overlap of the ages confronts us with this truth. We cannot run from these realities forever. We cannot run from these questions all of our days. We know that they are coming and that all God will send his son to come again. He will come in righteousness to judge the world. The question will be, will we be found united to Jesus on that day? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Lord who reigns in the age to come sends his blessings through the Holy Spirit through those who believe in the gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can know that you reign. That you reign in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, that his kingdom grows and advances as your gospel is proclaimed throughout the world. We thank you for this special time we've had today. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through it. We are so thankful. We are so humbled to be your covenant people in this world, called to do your work, called to live according to the change you bring about in us. We pray all these things in the name of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll close by singing number 399 in our blue hymnal, Jesus Shall Reign. And we will sing all the odd-numbered verses, verses 1, 3, and 5. 1, 3, and 5, all the odd-numbered verses of Jesus Shall Reign. Let's stand together and sing.
great day in Christ, receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.